Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Welcome to Zycell's Tech Talk. Today we're going to talk about some layer two, layer three questions that maybe some of you have already or may have um, or may have been dealing with in the past. Um, let me just get, get my, some of my screens here set up. I'm missing my participants view. There you go. Um, how's everybody doing today? Hope you're all doing well. Had a great uh, Memorial Day uh, weekend. Um, but we're back at it in the networking space, and hopefully you can learn some things. You know, I learned a lot while working here at Zysol. A lot of new technology always comes out, and it's always a lot of fun to learn new things. So uh, we want this to be interactive as well, so please use the Q&A section. Um, send me your questions. Um, I would like for this to kind of, again, be kind of open-ended, maybe a discussion uh, between questions and comments that you guys may have related to layer two and layer three. Um, let me see, by show of hands, um, how many of you are actually using layer three functionality in your networks today? Thank you, Rodelio. Um, thank you, Timothy. Also, maybe as you're, as I'm going through these, uh, you know, maybe some of these slides, think about and make comments about how are you using layer three in your industry, in your networks today, um, so that I can kind of feed off that as well and share that with the rest of, of the folks who are in this webinar today. Um, this is going to be recorded as well, so if we want to get back to it and, and check it out, you can check it out on our YouTube. I tried to start it on Facebook, but it, it didn't, um, didn't go through properly, so we'll have that on YouTube if I post it back onto Facebook onto the link to the YouTube side. Um, but definitely share with me what you're using layer two, and layer three, and, and kind of maybe even if you have some training background, because I think there's a lot of confusion that might come into play, especially for some partners who are not um, certified in any particular, you know, routing protocols, et cetera, with some of the big vendors that are out there. Um, so they're kind of going by what the vendor, like, you know, somebody like Zycel uh, helps them with in, in different applications and scenarios. And I want to just kind of cover some of those uh, potentially that I've seen in my experience here at Zyso, um, you know, where or when you should look for these different types of switches. Uh, but just some maybe, again, some just some early business here. Uh, we are Zyso Networks. We've been around since 1989, over 30 years now in the networking industry. 100 million devices making connections worldwide with uh, over 700 employees in 150 different markets. And a million businesses use Zycel Solutions today. Um, with that, also our Nebula Cloud Platform, over 500,000 devices now in Nebula Cloud Platform. And, and that'll be a great advantage of why you might want to think about that while you're using these switches. We're trusted to deliver our solutions to millions of end users uh, through a lot of different franchises or partnerships and companies that we work with worldwide. We also partner up with industry leaders uh, for their solutions, for their technologies, and for their expertise, and integrating that into our solutions and providing that to uh, you as partners to deliver to your customers. We like to work as a channel co a company, so we have sales reps um, that facilitate and um, kind of through the entire process from coming on board, working with distribution, helping with pre-sales, uh, getting you the right support that you need, uh, any of that. So reach out to them uh, in your appropriate state to, to reach out to the appropriate sales rep who will help you with um, you know anything that you need within the Zycel platform. We are solutions driven because we work with clients like yourself to deliver solutions and we make the product, uh, we make the software for the product as well. So any feedback you have, feature sets, functionalities, visibility, especially in our cloud platform, we're here to deliver that in future you know, future enhancements or even future products to meet you and your customers' needs. We are an end-to-end -end portfolio or networking company. We have everything that connects via security, wireless, ethernet that we're gonna talk about today, gateway solutions with hotspots, and then manage it either in standalone mode or in the Nebula Cloud platform that I mentioned earlier. So today I wanna to talk about our wired connectivity and specifically layer two and layer three. I did a poll just at the very beginning, but I saw a bunch of other people uh, come on board as well. So uh, what I want you to do is if you, if you can share with me through the Q&A section, um, you know, even though it's not a question, just to share with me, how are you using 
you know, uh, layer three, layer two in your applications today? And do you have a preference? Do you, do you, do you choose to go with layer two only, or do you don't know when you should use layer three? Or I'm getting a lot of inquiries from partners uh, who basically just ask for a layer three switch, even though they're not really using it. So there might be there's some confusion, which is why I kind of want to add this, um, uh, you know, this webinar to kind of have that open discussion of, of, you know, what are kind of the differences and kind of when you use in which kind of cases. So layer two, layer three, it just is part of the different layers that are in a network packet level. Um, you have your physical layer, your data link, you know, the OSI layers here, um, your data link, your network layer, your transport layer, your session layer, your presentation layer, and the application layer. Application layer is kind of like your, um, you know, UTM scanning packet level, looking at the actual application that's sending that particular packet or the packets themselves, what are they tagged as, and then using that information. Um, so being able to scan it at that deep level, whereas the physical layer is just your cable. So switches operate in that data link layer, network layer, and sometimes in that little bit of transport layer. Um, full layer three features is like a router, and it's usually has is, is you know full WAN technologies with WAN routing, um, DHCP, uh, a lot of IP management with firewall rules, et cetera, in that kind of networking layer to make sure that the IP addresses and domains are all you know where it needs to be with subnet masks, et cetera. Um, layer three kind of dabbles in that a little bit. Um, so layer three switches typically have features combining that layer two and some router features. And I'll kind of tell about what those are. Layer two switches, the pure layer two switches only deal with MAC addresses. And so they have no care with kind of understanding of IP addresses that are out there. So the number one question I always get is, you know, do I need a layer three um, switch to do VLANs? And the answer is depends. If you're trying to do it on an IP level, yes, you need a layer three. But if you are just doing basic VLAN using MAC addresses or trying to VLAN out ports or groups of addresses on a particular port, then a layer two is perfectly fine for that. And that's what it's made to do. So layer two switches build tables. Um, they just really are transferring packets and frames among different networks. And that's the most common type of um, layer two switch today. So that's what we typically use today. They operate at the data link layer, their MAC address learning. Um, and those are the MAC address tables that are within its device itself. And that's what you know you want to keep that in mind. It's MAC address based. Uh, layer two switches also typically operate on a single broadcast domain because they exist as a switch within that broadcast domain. Now, of course, there's going to be you know VLANs and, and things like that will that kind of separate that within the switch, but in general, the switches, a layer two switches operates within its own domain. Um, so all the devices that are connected to it and can, can communicate with it and are directly connected to it, or maybe even through an AP level, but still considered part of that single domain. Now, of course, you can always get to the, you know, you're talking about IP broadcast and VLANs, et cetera, but that's again, different in this regard. The device communicates on the same network, like I mentioned. So any devices that are connected to it communicates in that same network. But you can VLAN tag by the MAC address in a layer two address, um, layer two switch. So some switches, like especially today, um, you may have layer two switches for the home that are just kind of plug and play. They don't necessarily uh, have any um, you know, special tagging capability. So those may have non-VLAN tags as a layer two switch. But a lot of the managed switches that you find today, especially with Zyso, like our web managed, even our basic web managed switches, all the way up to the fully layer two, layer three managed switches, they can all tag by MAC address. Or they can use MAC address to even uh, auto um, tag as well. So typically some of those features, like an auto tagging of a device is usually like a layer three function. But the main difference is that the layer three is using IP addresses. So layer three switches use more of the IP protocol to identify the different addresses that are there. Typically, this could be a router um, is kind of the most common type of a layer three, I would say switch, but it dives into layer four, you know, routing uh, functionalities as well. But layer three switches operate that network layer. They use both Mac and the IP. So they typically will have both tables in the product. Um, so addressing for both IP addressing and for MAC addressing. Layer three typically is used for like a multi-broadcast domain. So 
not necessarily different VLAN, so kind of keep that separate because people I think are confusing, you know, both VLAN and different broadcast domains or different networks in saying, hey, layer three deals with different networks. Yes, but not not quite, you know, what you what you're thinking it's supposed to be. Uh, device communicates within or outside the network. So again, it kind of has the ability to talk on that local level as a layer two switch to these devices, but then can also communicate and route things outside of that network or to make decisions on where certain packets may go. So they typically can have like static routing or dynamic routing functionalities, uh, OSPF or RIP, um, maybe even ones with uh, VRRP as well for multi uh, switch um, high availability functionality. Um, but think of layer three as more of like routing or routing of either VLANs or routing of IP addresses within that network. So that's what those static routes and dynamic routes are. How many of you with the raise of hands do you know what static routing and dynamic routing in a switch is? Just by a show of hands, Let's see if anybody really. So David, thank you, Timothy, thank you. Yeah, so for the other for the others who are here who may not know necessarily, so static routing is like what it sounds like. You take, you say, hey, here's an IP address range, and you say it's coming from a source and a, and a destination. And typical switch will just, if it doesn't know what it, where it's supposed to send this packet, it just passes it to kind of the gateway, right? It says, hey, who who's the gateway? I'm just going to pass this all to you as the router to handle all of that information. Uh, but with static routing, you can actually now switch to um, kind of two um, two different networks if you need to. Let's say you, you have packets that are coming from this device, that should go out kind of to the voice network and routes that on a specific IP address. Or you can literally say from a public IP address standpoint, this IP block, any data that comes out is gonna go pass onto this other switch or this IP range that's controlled by this other switch. So it can make that choice. Dynamic routing can actually learn on who responds um, you know, back with the IP block range that you're trying to send the packet out from. And then the, you know, then it learns it and then it keeps that within its MAC tables and it addressing tables. So it knows that's where I should always send those packets when that's being addressed or that when I'm getting those kind of packets from those kind of uh, IP addresses. So it's, it's, it's useful in the sense that it can route to different networks IP address type networks as well, uh, but without having to deal with like a router to, to handle that kind of in between. But a lot of times you still need some sort of router or DHCP addressing that allows for, you know, those different subnets or those different IP device groups to have their own groups of IPs. Now the other, I, I would say the other application would be for dynamic or static routing is if you were kind of WAN facing you know, your internet connection was coming in, you had a block of a bunch of IP addresses that's coming from, let's say you have, you know, six IP addresses. You can create static routes that say, hey, if I get from the WAN side, from that, from the ISP, a packet that says bound for, you know, this public IP address on the, on the kind of the local side, and you want to split them up between those devices, um, you can then segment and say, hey, this, IP will go out this port in terms of its broadcast or in terms of its packet moving. So that then you could have a router on that end that picks it up. Now, of course, the router can also, um, you know, say here I am, uh, and and then the switch on the on the on the ISP side is going to learn that and know the packet or know the direction or which port it's supposed to talk to when that public IP is going. But sometimes you may have to segment or push public IPs uh, further down into your network. Um, and this is one of the ways to do that with, with static routing. Now, there's also some nomenclature that you see out there because there's a lot of, I guess, product that's layer two, but wants to be like a layer three, but doesn't have the capacity or doesn't have the need, especially from partners perspective, to go full-blown layer three. So we have this nomenclature that we've seen in, in the industry called layer two plus or some companies may take the top down and say it's a layer three light. So it depends on you know, what kind of uh, brand you're using. You know, we've used it kind of both ways, depending on the model, um, but there are some added features up there. So 
everything that you would be typically have for your layer two is all there. Um, um, and it usually just adds static routing to make it a layer two plus type switch. So again, that static routing is only when you need to push certain types of packets from one network to another using like an IP address scheme to force it down a path that it doesn't go through a normal gateway path. Uh, VLAN tagging is also based on IP instead of the port as well with like a layer two or layer three light. So you can use IP based VLAN tagging um, scenarios. Now there are advantages and disadvantages. You know, it's easier to work with IP addresses because then you can do some, uh, you know, dynamic or DHCP or sticky DHCP where you force specific devices to only get certain IP addresses. So then you can have control of those and how it kind of goes through the network and how you tag them, et cetera. But the disadvantage of using IP is that people could technically spoof an IP if they know that if they are in a certain IP range, they're going to get tagged by the switch and then allowed into whatever that network is, right? So there's conveniences, but then there's also some drawbacks that could potentially, you know, have a, an issue. So MAC address blocking or MAC address control is still kind of like the fundamental layer that lets you uh, have the most control and most security because it's not that easy to to kind of spoof a MAC address per se to to become that device on that network that you're blocking. Um, also, the other thing to look for uh, look for in a switch, whether it be layer two or layer three, or even layer two light or a layer three to two plus, is watch the backplane. There's a lot of competitors that are out there that offer kind of a half backplane, meaning that let's say you had just 10 gigs worth of, of ports, right? Let's say 10 gigs total and uh, or 10 ports of one gig, your backplane should at least be 20 gigabits because it needs to be able to operate what they call non-blocking um, up and down, you know, bi-directional speeds. Um, that gives you the full capacity so that if everything was fully loaded, overloaded to the max, you have that buffer. A lot of um, maybe competitive switches that may, or competitive switches that are trying to do either cost down, they're, they're only putting the backplane at a kind of half performance because they're, they're banking that you're not going to fully utilize the max um, performance potential of a gigabit. So you don't need two gigs per port. So instead they just give you one gig and, you know, hope that you just don't upload as much as you download at the same time on that port. So it again, depends on what you're trying to do, but most all Zyso um, switches that we have today, we're all non-blocking. So that's the meaning of non-blocking. There's some competitors that may spin it and say like non-blocking up to one gig, right? Instead of saying non-blocking, it's two gig. So there, there's some some wording that may be out there. So just be careful because the memory size uh, impacts, it, it's, a, it's kind of a case of the memory size and performance size um, on that switch. So that may be an adverse effect um, of buying a switch that might be kind of a, a lesser or a value type uh, budget. Now, some differences between layer three and router um, just so you can uh, get a kind of an idea of that the scope of a layer three. Again, it, it transfers between multiple devices across LANs, VLANs, and subnets, um, but they usually don't support like the WAN connection interface. Now, you could use it in a kind of an ISP level if you do static routing type, you could. Uh, for router, on the router side, it has all the WAN capabilities, it has the security, it has, uh, you know, it organizes it into different network segments you do by port you could do by vlan within the router as well both ip and by mac address information um and of course most importantly is the security side of things so router can provide you that security layer now there's some switches out there that are you know boasting that they can do some level of of um you know idp type scanning but Honestly, I think a router that's dedicated to doing all the things, not just IDP, but also um, intrusion detection, content filtering, anti-spam, malware protection, ransomware protection, that's what that router or security router like our USG Flexes do. And so to allow for that CPU to do all the things, it allows for your layer three switches to do what it just needs to do is move packets, uh, move data across the network as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Uh, so from a traffic management standpoint, layer three typically is a layer three switch is very high throughput, high port density, high traffic uh, capability. 
a router typically is using kind of some sort of software with hardware and they typically only have like four to eight ports it's not really made for a, a giant network um, and so managing that you know is, is a lot easier just from that one point but it doesn't typically have maybe kind of the throughput speeds that you would see on a on just like a you know, wired switch that's why we're going you know we're processing packets that are coming from the LAN going through to the WAN and vice versa from WAN to LAN and doing all this scanning and set uh, and security functions. So that utilizes, you know, CPU, which then ultimately means less performance. You know, that's why we're having that bottleneck as you're increasing your speeds. It's going to be very difficult as, you know, networks are getting to 2.5 or WAN connections are getting 2.5 gig, 5 gig, in some places even offering 10 gig connectivity to find a router that will be able to facilitate at, you know, a switch layer level, which is that, you know, those are kind of like the speeds that you're talking about. Um, layer three switches typically support a limited amount of routing protocols. I did mention some, you know, RIP and OSPF, et cetera, but it's more limited. Whereas routers have, you know, BGP, IG, uh, GRP, uh, all of that for any kind of weird routing scenarios that you need to do within the network. So they kind of still go hand in hand. Um, you know, a lot of people are trying to get rid of the router per se and try to get a DHCP enabled like layer three switch and just doing static or dynamic routing on the layer three switch itself. But again, you're missing out on all the other functions that are, are necessary at some point to touch the WAN. Of course, if you're just doing local area network kind of passing, maybe you're doing, um, you know, video, uh, AV, like pro AV over IP, then you have kind of your own world of, of networking and it doesn't need to go anywhere else. Um, or maybe even some VoIP applications where the voice server is all like housed, but the, you know, the, I, the IP PBX is within the prem then you could do that kind of routing, but it's really unnecessary to do that, I would say, uh, especially today with, you know, just basic VLANing and um, bandwidth control and segmentation of that already. Some advanced features at Layer 3, um, on the Layer 3 side, they do not support like edge technologies uh, that's, that's there, uh, whereas routers have a wide range of security features like VPN, firewalling, access control, you know, security policies. Um, switches are typically, in general, like lower cost because again, they're they're very uh, specific in what they do is really just to move the packet, move the traffic. Whereas the router is doing a lot of other things. There may be you know yearly subscriptions for licenses and security, but again, it's still a necessity within this kind of network. So, where should we use these um, different switches? So, if you're just doing a pure layer two domain then just use the layer two switch. And this is probably most of the scenarios that I've, I've dealt with. And that's pretty much covers most of all the businesses that you probably face as an end user, deploying a device within the office. You need to segregate that out in the access layer. Um, you know, you can attach APs to that. You can VLAN that out. So um, the only time you really need to use like a layer three is if you needed to aggregate multiple switches that are might part of different networks, or maybe those different networks all have different VLANs and you need to route the VLANs between the VLANs, okay? So let's say you have two different VLANs, VLAN one and VLAN two, but in some cases you wanted VLAN one and VLAN two to talk to each other in some special case, then you kind of have to tag that appropriately. So layer three allows for you to do some inter VLAN routing for those special you know, scenarios or cases. but you know, if you were going to have the whole VLAN one talk to anybody or everybody in full VLAN two, then there's no point to making kind of separate VLANs at that point, because if you've made a rule that, then they're pretty much one network. So there's no point in making that VLAN. But layer three is your choice when you're doing it in that distribution layer, typically. So again, you have an aggregate layer three that might put a bunch of access layer, layer two stuff in there. And if you don't have a scenario, you can just connect a bunch of layer two switches together and kind of a ring topology, then there's really no need necessarily to have that layer three. You could still, you know, process the VLANs in multiple different VLANs within that, um, you know, within that physical space. And that's what we see people do today anyways. They'll have multiple switches and, and they're delivering 
voice video data. They have wireless connected to it. They have a separate VLAN for maybe access controls, IP cameras, and those can all be handled at that layer two level and the MAC address level. And again, like I mentioned earlier, you go to layer three if you need that IP level, but again, IP level can be exploited by just giving yourself an IP in that particular space, especially if you're doing auto tagging. Um, we do auto tagging capabilities in our layer two switches on the MAC address level as well. So you could, you could set certain MAC addresses, maybe the first certain um, uh, octets there, and say those ones will get mapped to a certain VLAN. So it can auto tag VoIP traffic if you're doing VoIP phones, et cetera, to move them into a VLAN tag uh, for VoIP and then be prioritized, uh, et cetera. That can be done within our layer two side, uh, light layer two switches. Now, if you need to go to the ISP connection, if there's something that connects to that, then you need a router to handle that DHCP and the security levels that we talked about earlier. So just some of the background of some of the naming conventions that we have at SISO for our switches. Um, our ES is just 100 meg. Uh, we don't, typically don't have those switches anymore, except in some countries um, that still use fast ethernet. Uh, gigabit is GS. MG is our multi-gig switch line. Uh, XS is our 10 gig, but includes multi-gig, but typically all the ports are 10 gig capable, both copper and fiber. Um, XGS, is a gigabit switch, um, so one, one gig ports, but then dedicated 10 gig uplink. So the X just stands for 10 gig, a Roman numeral for 10. And then we have some new models that are in our XMG space. So those are multi gig with 10 gig ports, and they're kind of our 10 gig, multi gig hybrid um, switches there. If they end in an HP, they are our PoE or PoE plus plus switches. So providing power to APs and those types of devices. If it ends in an EP, then they are our kind of our like eco power, um, lower budget power, typically for our, maybe our voice customers or voice applications where the phones don't typically need a huge power budget. And because we do our power draws, um, we base all our budgets reduction from just the, the draw of the device itself, it's intelligent PoE. We can maximize the PoE budget that we have for the devices. And if it ends in FP, that we have some newer ones coming out, those are our kind of our larger power budgets um, units in the standard model. So it typically is our PoE plus and PoE plus plus. And the F, it ends in F, then it is a fiber version of the switch, meaning that they typically all have uh, fiber transceivers. William just made a comment saying, loving the 1930-30s. So that's our new uh, XMG 1930s that are out there. Um, and we'll, we'll show a slide on that too, but thank you, William. Um, David asked the question, do Zysel switches have options for designating voice and data VLAN similar to Cisco Meraki? And yes, and that is, uh, it can do that by auto. You know, we have an auto VLAN tagging capability. So in the layer two switch level, um, on kind of our XGS, or sorry, our 1920 series, our GS1920 series, um, they will have some, we call auto VLANing, and it's by on the Mac layer. So it will use, like if those phones, uh, you know, are designated and have a Mac address within the switch network, you can designate those Macs to auto provision into, um, into that VLAN, and then using that VLAN to allow for higher prioritization than the data VLAN. So typically this, the, di the default VLAN that's already out there is already a data VLAN. So you don't have to necessarily create a special one unless you had special data transferring through a network. Um, but again, you can say certain devices are on that VLAN. Maybe you have some servers or some devices within the billing department has access on that VLAN to get to the billing server, whereas the tech support uh, computers or networks do not have access to it. So you can segregate it that way and, and create either um, max security level uh, to do that. Now, if you move to a layer three switch, then it can do it by IP addressing. So you could say this entire subnet that we've assigned or DHCP for your voice network is going to get auto VLAN into the voice VLAN and get prioritized. And then the data 
users will automatically get put into the data VLAN by their IP address schemes um, to get that. Uh, Paul asks, have most multi-gig switches uh, dropped support for 10 base T? Yeah, I think I'm looking into that for you, Paul, um, but a lot of the chipsets on that higher end, like it's just so, it's just such an old, um, kind of an old technology that it's hard to find devices that, except maybe in some of your cases, some of the maybe printers or things like that. But it, it, I think in general, for most cases, it's going to be well, it may need to be about time to either switch out the interface or switch out the device, you know, to something newer that it might, might at least support like 100 megabits, you know, per second, because that's supported. Um, but thank you for your question. So the XS 1930, this is our 10 gig 1930 series. So 1930s is our web managed um, switch, but I'm gonna share with you why this is important. Why are you telling me about web managed, you know, layer two uh, level type switch? Well, I'll tell you in a little bit, um, but this is our uh, XS it has 10 gig uh, ports. We have a fiber version, so all 10 gig fiber. Um, this could be an, as an aggregate if you needed it to be, or a lot of people are using it for the PoE for powering up um, a, a Wi-Fi 6 or maybe a Wi-Fi 6E access point because it does offer you the 60 watt PoE. So on eight ports, it has a 300, um, uh, I think it's 300, 370 power budget, 375 watt power budget. So that's a lot of power that you can you know split between those eight ports power up pretty much every wi-fi 6 ap that's out there today uh, and then provide you with the uplink you know a lot of those high power ap's need 2.5 5 gig connectivity or maybe even some have 10 gig uh, connectivity just for their bandwidth uh, uplink port so now you're able to deliver that or applications where you're delivering poe power to pan tilt zoom cameras or maybe some high powered um, conference with like cameras built in with video, um, kiosks, or even powering up some laptops through, you know, the, just the PoE port. That's possible as well. So we see that. So our XS, these are all 10, uh, 10 gig capable. The new XMG 1930 that William just mentioned um, series. Uh, this is something that we just launched fairly recently and it's available. Um, it is a multi-gig switch. So there's some ports that are uh, gigabit and 2.5. There's four of them that can be anywhere between one gig all the way up to 10 gig. And then there's two 10 gig SFP pluses as well. And then there's a PoE version that comes with 700 watts of PoE power. Um, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're looking. Also, just also keep in mind, keep the specs on this particular switch. There's eight ports that will do the ultra PoE with the 60 watt, and the other 20 watt, uh, 20 ports will do the 30 watt standard. So kind of a split. Maybe you might have some devices that are needing that higher PoE budget. So those are just kind of the port configurations. So keep that in mind. We tried to color coded it so that you can see um, what's what. Also the LEDs are color coded too. So when you have devices connected to it, you can find out what they're connected at. So this is why I was waiting to tell you and why I was talking about the 1930 series in general, because our access layer three license upgrade for our 1930 series is available today. So with one click, you can upgrade the smart managed switch, this hardware platform to a layer three access switch without any additional hardware or replacing out the network. So maybe today you're deploying this as a layer two, but in the future, um, you may have some expanded need, or maybe this series is what you want to standardize on, then you can use it for both a layer two application, or you can bring it up to that distribution access or distribution um, aggregate level and make it a layer three and give you some great features and functionalities um, that are available today uh, with this. So typically our 1930 series, because it is web managed and Nebula managed, you have to do it through the web GUI or through Nebula. But by adding this license, you now will get configurable using the, the CLI command line interface. So now you can telnet to it, console to it, SSH to it, um, and manage it that way 
um, you know, with Cisco like uh, capabilities as well, and be able to use that to, you know, for whatever needs you may have. Uh, a lot of our partners, excuse me, like the CLI because then they can script things on their front end to make changes on the back end to these devices. Um, so they, they make a lot of cool tools that, that help them in that way. If you don't want to use our kind of our Nebula platform. It also expands network capacity. So it gives it larger table sizes for static VLANs, for Mac, the MAC address the table, for static routes, for IP addresses and for ACLs. So it enlarges that kind of network scale uh, in a layer three kind of network. But again, you don't really need this if you're just going, I'm just deploying these in an office environment. Even if that office environment might be like 500 users, like it doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of what your application is and what you're trying to do. A lot of times the network layer two is more than enough for, for what you're doing because you're still, again, layer two with VLAN by the MAC address and VLAN um, bandwidth control. Those are kind of the two main features of layer two that people think it's part of layer three. So there's that, that slight discrepancy, right? MAC address layer two, IP addressing layer three. Uh, it also adds some VLAN management as well. So MAC-based VLAN tagging additional um, subnet protocols, VLAN isolation, uh, VLAN Q and Q typically. So you can route between or you tag, tag a VLAN tag with another tag as you're kind of encapsulating it, bring it to another network uh, or transporting it across different networks. So you can maintain those VLAN tags. You can get more security protection now. Uh, you're adding uh, TAC authentication, MAC authentication, IP source guard, account security, and many more different security protocols within this license upgrade. You get network AV mode. So if you're, again, if you're doing um, network AV for, for multicast of screens, televisions, uh, hospitality applications, digital signage, now it gives you this AV mode that you can choose in the wizard to get to um, and have the configurations be simplified for just those things that you need for network AV, like MRV and MLD snooping, flow control, dip serve, et cetera, for better traffic control of that, um, of that network. So you can, you can standardize on this type of product to do the both or a lot of different scenarios. Uh, remote PD rescue. So by doing auto PD recovery to detect the device's health remotely, recover those devices automatically as well. So it's smart, intelligent to see that hey, maybe the power device, uh, like an AP stops responding or an IP camera stops responding or sending traffic. You can set up thresholds to make it auto recover by power cycling the, the PoE uh, on that port. Um, Robert asked, will recording be available for this presentation? Yes. So this and all of our webinars that we do are typically found either on our Facebook, but most of all, they're on our YouTube channel. And I have a, you know where to go on that at the end of my presentation. And the activation is pretty simple to activate layer three. You log on to your MyZysel account. That's the, where we handle all of our licensing across our platforms. You, if you've already been there for Nebula, if you've been there before for our security product line, You'll, you'll know exactly where that is. So you just go in there, you register with the device license key. So the license keys are a one-time unlock for the device. So it's not a yearly subscription to use the layer three functionality. So it's just, it's just a cost for the layer three function for us to not have to make a separate piece of hardware that has you know, layer three functions, right? So this will help to optimize both you know, supply chain availability, but also for you, uh, as a partner, something to standardize on and be able to choose it as a layer two and then move it to layer three as you need, right? Then you don't have to worry about a different device, different interface. You're just having to worry about that uh, device. And just by adding the license, it will unlock the, the key for that MAC address and that will be unlocked forever um, for that device. So you just register the device, you register the key, you link the, the license to the device like you do with like our security products or with Nebula. And then you just check the device license information on the device, uh, or you might have to hit the refresh button just so it grabs the new license through the server there. What is the layer three cost? So in general, uh, the prices are on our price book. You'll see them at our distribution level too, as a layer three license. But in general, 
I would say the price is somewhere around 20% of the, maybe the price of the device itself. So that one-time charge is kind of like that upcharge, which is actually very competitive to what you would, um, you know, if you just bought a pure layer three switch in the open market today, um, that 20% doesn't even get to that point of, of, of some of those switch prices that are there. So um, you'll, you'll see it online. Of course, the licenses are also partner discounted. So if you are a Zyso partner, it's, you're going to get the discounts that you have through distribution to buying those licenses. So then in the user interface like the XMG, you'll see that the device now is licensed uh, with the standard license and it has no expiration date. So now you have full access to, again, all of those features that you saw on the previous slide um, for, for the functionality. And typical standalone management for this kind of switch, again, access points, servers, 10 gig storage devices, plugged in Wi-Fi 6E access points powered up by this uh, type of device. Then you have our firewall um, doing all the WAN connectivity and our security platform, um, ransomware blocking, et cetera, to the internet. So even though you have a layer three activated XMG, you would still want to have a security firewall to do your DHCP, your um, you know, DNS information, all of that usual WAN interface on the firewall. And in a scenario where you might want or to use a access aggregation switch, you can use our XS3800. That is our layer three uh, aggregation switch. It comes with a bunch of different uh, fiber ports with 10 gig or copper ports with 10 gig um, that can aggregate this kind of XMG switch. And again, it can then pass, you can use those layer three features to let's say move uh, maybe some functionalities or some network access between home one to home two. I don't know why, but let's say you needed to, and these were on kind of separate networks or separate VLANs, then you could you could route them uh, via VLAN routing across those different networks there, or use static routing or IP routing to have that communication. Maybe maybe this is like somebody owns two homes in two different states, and they kind of or, or two different buildings. Or, yeah, and they want these two different networks to be able to talk to each other, this could be a, a way to do it as well. So I did mention that XS3800 series. It's our Nebula Flex Pro uh, capable. And again, all of these switches that I just mentioned, including the XS3800, is manageable in our Nebula Cloud Platform. So this gives you all that um, you know, layer two functionality in Nebula, and then also layer three functionalities within that as well. So it's kind of a Frankenstein box. This does not have PoE. So it's more of an aggregate um, with, you know, uh, flexible shared ports of, of 10 gig and fiber. So there's some that are dedicated, but you'll see some here on the uh, kind of the right side of the switch where there's two, two ports and then there's two fiber, two ports, two fiber. Those are typically shared. So you have to pick it, you can pick and choose if you want to use more fiber or more copper ports. And then we just also launched our XGS2220 series. Um, so these are our gigabit layer two and layer three switches with 10 gig uplinks. And they also have uh, versions that are 400 watts, 600 watt, and 900 watt of PoE power. So check that out. These are uh, already unlocked with the layer two, layer three functionality. So you don't have to get a license to add to this. So all of the um, voice VLAN, the MBR, IGMP snooping, the um, uh, AV over IP or network AV operations and modes are available in this device as well already. Um, so all of those static routes, uh, feature functionalities that you would typically get in CLI are available in this model as well. So that's the same with our, our kind of our GS2200 series, or sorry, 2220 series. If you've been using our 2210, XGS2310, those don't have, they'll, they'll have the layer three, but they don't have Nebula. So this is our Nebula Pro capable uh, model, and it comes with one year of the Pro Pack bundle as well. So you're getting a lot of value in this, this particular model with that 10 gig up. So like I mentioned, you know, the more, the more you do, the more things you want to be able to handle with security, being able to do VLAN, voice automated VLAN, 
based on the device, either again with layer three by the IP or maybe the OUI, and then be able to detect, reconnect, and recover PoE devices. And we use intelligent PoE on these switches. So you can power up probably twice as many devices on a single switch, depending on the power draw of the devices that you've used today. We have CCTV, IPTV reporting capabilities within uh, a lot of these types of switches and machine learning to identify maybe where there's some blocking and then do some uh, broadcasting, uh, storm mitigation, and auto corrections of maybe some of the configurations that are being done, especially if you're handling it within our uh, Nebula platform. So I did mention our partner program. So we are a channel cust uh, channel distributor uh, or manufacturer of hardware equipment. We distribute through DNH, Ingram Micro, TD Cynix, Wave, Target Distribution, and Pace. And so as a partner, you get your discounts through um, those distribution side of things. Um, so you know you start out at Silver if you're not a partner. There's no cost for you to join, um, and there's no cost to be in our partner program at all. Uh, we want you to get to the gold, so that gives you the max, num max percentage discount through distribution, and we try to fight and, and keep you know, the pricing on the, on the visible pricing as clean as possible so that you can maximize your margins uh, and selling it to your end users and your partners. So if you want to find out more information of our partner program, please reach out to one of those um, sales account managers, and they would love to talk to you about how to become a partner. So I did mention where we could where you could find some of the videos as well as some other information. You can connect with us on zycel us channel on our LinkedIn, or you can look for Zycel America channel on YouTube, and that will have this recording in a few hours and all of the previous webinars and recordings that we've done in the past as well. Um, you can also go to our website and go to our uh, support and training. And there'll be a webinar section where you can start searching with keywords to find maybe some of the topics that we did in the past and it will link you to and link you through to the youtube side as well um let's see rodelio said given that layer 3 switch can function both as switch and router would you recommend using the layer 3 switch versus layer 3 router for better network performance and vlan segmentation given that the layer 3 switch can function both as switch and router so I would say in some special scenarios, Rodelio, like yes, you could use the layer three switch to, to do the router functions if the router is not really connected to the internet because the switch in itself is not gonna do SPI firewalling. It's not gonna do you know, your IP, um, DHC, uh, DHCP usually, it won't do that or it won't be able to manage the IP pools. Um, and, and of course it's not doing uh, network translation. So it's not doing the NAT as well. So you might have a private network that's running that it, you know, it's not going to be able to go out to the internet. It still needs some sort of router there to do that. So again, you can pick and choose whether you want to, um, you know, do some of those layer three routing functions that a router would do. But ultimately, in the end game, you still will have a router if you go to the internet. And that's most businesses today. Again, if you had kind of a closed network where you're just talking to a server and or a you know video conference or a concert venue where you don't need to have public internet access at all, all of your content and your video service or video serving where your data is all housed within that network, then yes, you could. But routers are relatively inexpensive today anyways, but it allows to give you a lot more feature and protection and security if you're plugging in into a, a network. So, um, let's see, Paul says, with respect to VoIP and layer two switches, it seems that primary feature that one, one is after is prioritization. True, yes, like a lot of VoIP needs prioritization, except perhaps for reducing broadcast traffic. Are there other advantages to putting VoIP on separate VLANs? Um, typically, it allows for you to just make sure that your, your network is clean. Uh, when you do have it separate, then you, you, you can, you know, if you have all the things are on the same network, it's hard to attribute unless then you do some packet sniffing and, and things like that to to kind of attribute if something is wrong on that, you know, on that uh, on that network that may be causing issues with your VoIP. So if you can separate your VoIP into its own pipe 
and you can prioritize that pipe, then you have a lot more control of where that data is going uh, and how it's being affected by anything else that's in that network. So people downloading files, or even if a network is getting flooded, um, you can make it so those packets don't overcome or override you know, the, the VoIP traffic per se. Let's see, Rodelia asks, do you currently support uh, SFP 25 gig? If not, would that be in the works in the near future? The answer is yes. We do have a layer three um, feature uh, switch that's coming out, but typically they are more on the 10 gig side. So 10 gig uplinks or all 10 gig ports fiber with 25 gig capable. So it's 10 gig and 25 gig ports SFPs. And it'd be like a 48 port. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out too, is if there are customers who need a, you know, a 24 port version of that. We have a customer that wants a 48 port version of that. And it will have like 100 gig um, uplink ports uh, as well. So some of that SFP, SFP 28, I think ports, the 40 gig or the 100 gig um, in the near future. So and that's, that's probably about a year out. I don't see SFP 25 gig being in demand into like where most of our space is right now, which is in the small business aspect, because in the local, in the local prem, um, more and more applications are getting pushed out to the cloud. So that puts in more, I guess, more, um, more emphasis or more pressure to get a larger WAN connection piece. So I think the bigger component that is going to have pressure is the the firewall if you want to maintain security uh, to have that kind of speeds to, to maximize those cloud applications through a secure channel. So that's going to be probably our, our bigger issue. Now, if you're doing, you know, things like locally and you need that 10 gig, you know, then there's going to be some switches that are coming out. Let's see, normally we use the Mac-based vendor codes to pull the device into the correct VLAN. Yeah, exactly. So that's perfect um, within that. Uh, using that feature to use the Mac base. So again, layer two with um, with the switches like our 1920 series or 1930 series will have that Mac based uh, VLAN capability to pull those um, vendor codes in. So I wanted to also announce that we have um, been attending and been putting on some top golf events as a kind of a meet and greet with some partners, uh, with any partners that are in the area or happen to be in the area at that time. So if you want to take a QR code of that, you also probably get some emails from us mentioning where we are going next. Um, in June, we're going to be in Houston, I believe, in a couple of weeks for the Top Golf event. So if you want to come visit us, um, if you happen to be in the Houston area in that mid-June time frame, I won't be there for this event this time, but Jacob Olson will be there. So if you happen to again be in Houston and want to meet up with, with Jacob and you know talk about um, Zycel and talk about our partnership with Zoltis on the unified communication side. Um, please feel free to, to join that. You also see this, um, all the events and all the locations that we're going to every month in our events page. This will also take you there as well, but please sign up. Um, sign up soon and early so we know how many people are gonna be there so we have enough food and enough bays there at the Top Golf location um to spend a few hours together and just chat business and just hit some golf balls and have some fun so please feel free to join that so if you have any other questions please use the q a section at this time we are running a little bit out of time um, but if you do want to connect with me or if you have questions maybe later on today email try tri at zysel.com and let me know uh, also you can connect with me on linkedin as well just search for a zysel try and you'll you'll find my my picture and my ID if you want to request um, to link up. Ken has a has a comment or question. I have a client with approximately thirty five WAX um, six six hundred three Ds and higher bandwidth and power uh, twenty four port switch would uh, and power. Which twenty four port or twenty eight port switch would be considered? So I would I would say an XMG um, would be a one that you might want to look at an XMG 1930 to power that uh, on the it's a 30 port switch, but it has like 24 port uh, usable um, like PoE ports to, to, to consider. And it does have up to 700 uh, 
watts of power. Most of the WAX series is going to draw in below the 27 watt space. So it depends on how you divide it up. You might have to use two of the 24 ports to kind of get maximum, um, you know, kind of, because it's 35 is kind of in a, in a kind of a midline. You can't use just one switch, but then two is like too many, right? So that's kind of your choice. Or the other option is to use an XGS 2220-52 FP, and that has like 900 watts of power. And that potentially will get you all the power you need for those 35 WAXs in a one in a single switch. And that'll be a 52 port switch. Now we have you know the 600 watt version, and then we have a 400 watt in a 24 port. Um, uh, what do you call it? In a 24 port configuration, so you can use two of those as well. So if you don't need multi gig, if the WAX uh, 603 doesn't need the multi gig, it just has gigabit ports then you can get away with the XGS2220. All right. Thank you, Paul, for your, your continued support and your, your, your continued uh, um, just being, being here and, and visiting with us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I need to look into that, Rodelio, on your question. Can you send me um, your question like that or just copy that into an email um, and expand upon that a little bit um, in an email to me? And I will see if I could get anybody to, to check there for you. And of course, there's, you know, we always work with other. Um, SIM vendors to, to make sure we're in their platform. Uh, if you have specific ones or the popular ones that you see out in the market and want us to work with them, uh, then you know definitely we can we could pull that on board and see how we can get on board with that. And we've, we've been working with a few SOC uh, vendors like SOC Suitor um, and some of those, you know, uh, MSP Guard or 360, um, Lion Guard. So a lot of them have implementations that, that utilize our, our products. All right, if there's no other questions, again, thank you so much. Hope you had a great week, great weekend, and I uh, hope you have a great coming week. I know the summer's coming and hopefully all of your vacations and time off um, will be a good one. Uh, wish you best and um, look forward to talking to you again at another Tech Talk. Uh, we'll look forward to being your networking partner. So hopefully we'll, we'll see you at an event or I'll see you at a future webinar. Thank you for your time. Have a great afternoon.